We've seen this before. It was beaten back in 1964. It will be beaten back again, but not because we want it to happen. It will only be beaten if you organize, and that becomes uh, the key factor. So, you know, as James said, here we have 18 states that have already adopted these so-called religious freedom laws. You have another 25 states that have proposals on the books, and you have another 85 proposals that are under consideration. So when you add all of that up, we are close to having a significant majority of states potentially, potentially, moving to adopt these laws at a time when we are seeing great victories. The leadership conference, and I'm proud to say this, led the fight, led the fight uh, for the passage of the Matthew Shepard James Byrd Hate Crimes Law. You look back at that, hey, I'm very proud of that, guys. Very proud of it. You look back on that time, you look at the hate crimes law, boy, what, what was the big deal? It just seems so natural. Why couldn't we do it? But guys, I'll tell you, it took us 14 years to pass that statute. 14 years to strengthen a federal hate crimes law that benefited the country in its entirety only because we sought to include LGBT protection in that statute. And while it looks relatively tame today, 13 or 14 years is a long time to struggle for this effort. What it says is, again, not a moment. This has to be a movement if you want change. And so that's really, I think, the theme that we're trying to promote here. And it really requires a twofold effort, in my view. One, you've got to organize as you're doing at the state level. I want to give the uh, HRC, Human Rights Campaign, I want to give the National Gay and Lesbian Task Force, and all the other activist groups, the trans community and many others, who are organizing at the state level and doing such a terrific job. You've pulled in, for example, the state chambers of commerce to make, a, uh, make some noise. You have national organizations like Walmart and Apple who have done a terrific job, so that's great. You also have, as Jennifer pointed out, religious activists at the state level who are making a huge difference. We could not do this without the kind of progressive response that the religious community has provided. I want to give Jennifer a lot of credit because that, you know, trying to impanel progressive Baptists, for example, to challenge the majority Baptist church, church is a big part of what we do. So you have to have that state effort. I'm looking to bring in state attorneys general to organize at the state level so that they will oppose these statutes, make clear that they have dangerous implications that go well beyond what ordinary uh, uh, you know, people are talking about at the state level, so that's important. But you also need a federal campaign. We are hosting a series of confidential conversations to see how we integrate LGBT equality into the majority of civil rights statutes, the iconic statutes that are really setting the frame for equality in America. It sounds easy, of course. Just add, you know, protective language to the Civil Rights Act of 1964. But it's not that simple. You have to look at Title II of the Act, Title VI of the Act, Title VII of the Act, Title VIII. Title VIII deals with housing. Title VII deals with employment. Title VI may well uh, include sex and uh, sexual discrimination in a way that's got to be protected. Title II deals with public accommodations. Now, adding that language may seem simple, and obviously the civil rights community, broadly defined, clearly supports the equality principle and has full support for the idea of making those statutes inclusive. But here's the rub. There's a concern that when you open up these statutes at the federal level, you will find that you uh, actually enhance the risk that conservative majorities, both in the House and Senate, will use this opportunity to actually promote additional restrictions in some of the areas where we thought we had victory. And there's a real concern about how that will play out. So these conversations are not going to be easy, but they do require coalition uh, efforts to make that happen. So here's one last example before I wrap it up. We are struggling in the African-American community, the Latino community, broadly defined, to restore the Voting Rights Act to its primacy before the Supreme Court rendered a destructive decision almost two years ago in Shelby County versus Holder. It's a decision that blew, hey, thanks guys, I appreciate it, it blew a hole in the Voting Rights Act, and we're trying to, to repair that hole. June 25th is the second anniversary of that statute. 
We have a problem in the House and Senate, not <laughs> dissimilar at all from what the LGBT uh, community is experiencing. We've got people who are standing in literally the courthouse door trying to prevent us from even having a hearing on the legitimacy of the issue. So I've got somebody named Bob Goodlatte, who is the chair of the House Judiciary Committee, who refuses to give us a hearing on immigration issues or on voting rights. And we're saying, look, enough of that. We've played nicely with him now for the past two years. We've made uh, compelling cases that require him to take into account that repairing the law is necessary. We've shown him examples of the problem in his home state of Virginia, and still he turns his back on the legitimacy of our argument. So we've got to raise our voices and take this issue to the next level. We're hosting a demonstration in his district on the anniversary of the Supreme Court decision on June 25th, and we want the LGBT community to be there with us to stand for the equality on the right to vote that we want in every other aspect of American life. You want a friend, you have to be a friend. We are prepared to embrace the equality principle in its fullest. And I think what Julian has done, both in his professional career, in his work with the NAACP, and in his very existence has helped to really challenge that effort. As we remind Senator Mitch McConnell, were it not for Loving versus Virginia, you and your wife couldn't live where you live today. Okay, they live Good in Virginia. Point. He and Elaine Chow could not live in Virginia were it not for Loving versus Virginia. And the same equality principle has to be applied across the board.